Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jasmine, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, before I go into the paper as such, uh, 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 my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Nebu Thompson for this opportunity. Uh, not just because I'm interacting with a vibrant group of scholars who are interested in food, but also for bringing me down to uh, Nirmala College and for offering the sumptuous lunch. It's been quite some time since I've had proper food in that sense. And uh, a word of gratitude to Dr. Anita J. Mathan and Ms. Anu for thinking of food. And uh, uh, my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Pius Malik Andatil and also Professor Thomas Kiwi for hosting me. Right. And now I go into the paper. Uh, it is titled uh, Culinary Terroir and the Terrain of Liberal Arts. Uh, so, th so this is the topic that I came up with after looking at the title of the conference, which is Culinary Aesthetics in Cultural Studies. So a bit of the, uh, a part of the title is actually alluding to the evolution of cultural studies, so to speak. Uh, but I'm not going into that aspect in detail, but I'll very quickly ask you to look up the origins of cultural studies in a way through Raymond Williams' work and of course the distinctions between Birmingham School of Cultural Studies and uh, the Frankfurt School, uh, which initiated a sort of an engagement with uh, the popular spaces, which was alluded to in the inaugural sessions, the opening up of coffee houses, for instance, uh, the evolution of culinary spaces that way. And in India, uh, particularly with the national education policy, there has been a sort of a, a return to the idea of liberal arts, so to speak. So liberal arts was largely a European uh, intervention wherein uh, there was a lot of interactions between arts, humanities, natural and social sciences. Uh, wherein the analytical, creative, and skill-based knowledge bases of each scholar was in a way put to use. So what uh, liberal arts essentially talks about is the need for an inter-trans, multi-disciplinary uh, approach. And if you're looking at food studies, and if you are really interested in food studies, you will have to open your uh, boundaries a bit more, expand your boundaries a bit more, and be willing to engage with other terrains. So in a way, uh, the terroir, the terroir bit I'll come to in a bit, the terrain of liberal arts is largely uh, a sort of an evocation for you guys to kind of open your field of experiences into various other areas apart from literature, per se. Uh, but, but in the course of the lecture, I'll also try to kind of bring back the attention to English studies as well, because most of us are scholars of English studies. Now, uh, my lecture is in a way divided into uh, three major sections. The first section will, in a way, take you to the basics of what it means when it comes to understanding food study. So this is one of the questions that Dr. Nibu asked in the inaugural lecture. How do we do food studies? What are the aspects that we should worry about? So I'll begin with that. And then I'll very quickly take you through what I consider are uh, paradigm shifts that have come in the Indian scene, to be precise. Because if you're looking at most of the work that's been done on food studies, we tend to keep on uh, using a lot of Western critics, Levi Strauss, uh, David Kaplan. So, so, but there is a wide range of work that has been done from the Indian uh, academic space and also pertaining to India and the Indian subcontinent. Right? Uh, the, th the third part would be a sort of a uh, deliberation with few texts which will help you to uh, I hope which will help you to understand how to go about doing food studies. All right. Now, uh, let me begin with uh, 
as uh, you know highlighting four main aspects that you associate food associate with food on a day to day basis all right the first one is the lived experience all right so when i'm so we just had lunch right so what would be the lived experience of having lunch so why are you having lunch ma'am don't ask me any question ask us any question we just had lunch and just want to sleep right that is also a lived experience right so the idea that it's just fuel for the body it can have uh, an aspect where it's meeting your biological needs it could be medicinal it could involve nutrition so you might think that all these aspects are not in a way pertinent to humanities but on the contrary all of these aspects are in a way slowly being inducted into english studies uh the next important aspect which is central to the uh, concept note of the conference is the cultural bit of it what does cultural aspect of food imply or what do you mean by that uh it has largely to do with significations or meanings right the fact that you chose to eat beef today or the choice in a way is again a cultural indicator so when you're looking at the cultural aspect of food it is asking you to engage with interpretations meanings and largely takes you through food ways and mores of a society uh, which are a set of moral norms or customs derived from generally ac accepted practices rather than written laws so ceremonial role so we have papers or discussions pertaining to that the third aspect would be the emotional or the spiritual aspect which is food for thought you know food for the mind food for the soul and the last one which is also in a way alluded to uh, in the keynote which has to do with communal or relational aspects all right uh, i am not using the words communal or relational in a derogatory or a, in a negative manner i am asking you to kind of look at those terms where you are looking at food practices as means of connecting you know communal relational aspects as marking connections all right now coming to one of the ideas that this conference focuses on the idea of food as a code so we listed out four aspects what is it that uh, you know that has to be understood from these or, or, or that is common to all these four connections one would be tangibility of food it is a material that we consume all right the next aspect is whether we are merely eating the material or consuming the material right so i would also invite you to think about that now when you say the word food as a code you are reminded of the idea of signifier and the signified you know how each word is comprise is called a sign and it has these two elements and when i utter the word idiyappam what does that signify idiyappam idiyappam yes so idiyappam is a material thing right so as far as signifier goes it refers to the tangibility of idiyappam you can hold it in your hand yeah whereas how would you uh, you know try to connect to the intangible bit of it which is the signified which is the concept what is the concept of idiyappam and what is the difference between the concept and the idiyappam that we eat all right so when we are eating idiyappam are we eating it or are we consuming it all right eating just means that you are kind of it's it's very visceral to some extent yeah but when you are consuming it it requires a much more deeper engagement in the sense that you should be in a way thinking i don't think when we are having breakfast we would be worried about where idiyappam came from all right Uh, so it's all in the past so past cannot be redeemed but, but every day we are having idiyappam as a staple but one of the things that you can ask yourself 
is is idiopum our own does it have a origin elsewhere right so if you are while you are eating idiopum you are thinking about its origin it means that you are consuming all those historical socio cultural transactions that have gone into it all right so that's what i meant by uh, tangible intangible and also food involves implicit and explicit aspects as well so we deal with a lot of binaries in that sense and when we say binaries uh, we are reminded of levi strauss's raw and cooked binary but uh, most of the western theoreticians such as pierre bourdieu uh, gabriel savarin mary douglas roland barth claude levi strauss all of them have been engaging with a, a european continental culture that is largely predicated on class dynamics and i would like to argue that a, a sort of a theorization based on class would not in a way be effective in a space like india or the larger indian subcontinent which is in a way governed by pluriversality right so that is the reason why i a thought of introducing you to certain shifts that have come in understanding food studies in india all right so if you are looking at the major texts uh, about food in india the first such text is uh, by this critic called arjun apadurai who published uh, this essay called how to make a national cuisine in 1988 so if you you know focus on the identity of apadurai apadurai doesn't ex in a way confine himself to india or the indian subcontinent he is part of the diaspora right and most of the introductory uh, essays on indian food studies come from the diasporic space and there is a problem there because uh the indian diaspora tends to look at all the representations initiated by the indian diaspora kind of tends to look at india as a homogenized whole right all of you must be familiar with jumpa lahiri yeah 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 um have you read her work the namesake can you uh identify any food item that she talks about in the book Okay, we looked at mistress of spices. Yeah. 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 Um. Then, have you uh, read Brick Lane? No. 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 All right. Oh, my simple question to you is: Would Jumba Lehri be talking about Idiapam in her work? No. Why? yeah she is in a way for grounding her bengali identity so the problem with diasporic individuals engaging with food studies in india is precisely that because they try to bring in a homogenized idea which then uh, gets inducted into the intellectual circle in the west so the west has an understanding of india and the culinary culture of india as a homogenized whole all right so if i go to america for instance and say that i am from south india the first thing that comes to their mind is that i eat idli dosa sambar every day but my staple is not idli dosa sambar it's putta idiyappam appam etc so there is no space for pluriversality in the early engagements with the idea of indian cuisine when you are looking at the critics so it's not just arjun apadurai but jumpa lahiri in 2000 wrote an article called indian take out how a family of pirates from rhode island brought home all the flavors of calcutta in a single suitcase so that's the title of her article she begins with indian take out and ends with calcutta all right so there is a problem and then we have ashish nandi who brings out two essays ethnic cuisine the significant other the changing popular culture of indian food preliminary notes all right again ashish nandi is an expatriate writer and they are kind of trying to talk about the idea of india 
Then we have Anudha Manur, who from 2003 onwards, 2003, 2004, 2007, publishes uh, interventions into the idea of what she calls as culinary nostalgia by looking at the South Asian diasporic writers. So the South Asian diasporic writers are essentially giving us a homogenized idea of Indian cuisine, which is in a way taken forward by another Manu, even though she tries to problematize it to some extent. But uh, the understanding of any sense of food studies being done in India is from this largely homogenized uh, lens. All right? But uh, if you're looking at the kind of work that is done in India, it is initiated in the second, almost in the second decade of the 21st century. So uh, the, the beginnings of a paradigm or a uh, direction of inquiry into food studies in India begins with the diasporic community. Then there is a sort of an attempt to question that, which comes through the engagement with, uh, say, the caste politics in India. All right. All right. So if you're looking at the diasporic writers, they are largely from an upper class, upper caste background. So their own representation of India is hence problematic. And I would want you to kind of uh, think about this work. This is uh, uh, a project taken up by, Kranth, uh, by the Gen Women's Studies Circle of Kranti Jodi Savitra Bai Phule Women's Studies Center uh, in Pune. Right. This was a project headed by Sharmila Rege and Deepa Tak. And they asked the women who were part of that university, mostly Dalit women, to write down recipes. All right. And the, the project was then published and it was titled, Isn't This Plate Indian? Dalit Histories and Memories of Food. All right. What I want you to focus on is the reference to, isn't this plate Indian? Right? In, the, in the introduction, uh, Ms. Jaswin referred to Thali. Yeah? And uh, so when you're looking at the word plate, it is a reference to a Thali. All right? And Thali is like, it's, 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 it's a, it's, it's, there's a lot of food items on a Thali. All right? And the equivalent of that would be our sadhya. But when you're looking at the first point that I raised, the lived experience, do we have talis on a day-to-day -day basis? And even if we are having tali on an everyday, that would indicate that you have, you are privileged enough to have these many food items for lunch, right? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, so they, they began, began with this basic question, question isn't this plate Indian, Indian by referring to the Dalit, 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 Dalit recipes Dalit, that were cooked Dalit, 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 in their household on an everyday basis. And then they realized that the food that we have on a day-to-day -day basis is not a thali. So the Indian plate or the Indian thali that is projected as part of the Indian cuisine is not essentially something that a common man would, would have access to, all right? This kind of opens up one of the paradigms for food studies in India, wherein it goes against the class aspect that the Western theorist foreground, all right? So in 2009, this work happens and we start to look at the idea of Indian cuisine afresh. There is a shift back to the indigene, so to speak, because uh, Dalit's is, the Dalit identity is in a way connected to, yes, of course, the Varna system, which also in a way is connected to their occupation. But to, a, to some extent, Dalit cuisine, if you go through the recipes that's written down, it is interesting because they stick to materials or ingredients that are accessible to every man. All right, they cannot afford a lot of, you know, uh, uh, ingredients that are not essentially endemic to the region that they are from, right? So that initiated that questioning of what constitutes Indian thali. 
Then Gopal Guru in 2009 publishes this article called Food as a Metaphor for Cultural Hierarchies, which essentially takes forward this argument. This is Gopal Guru, uh, Food as a Metaphor for Cultural Hierarchies, and Priscilla Prakhurst Ferguson comes up with the idea called culinary nationalism, which kind of uh, goes against the idea of culinary nostalgia, so to speak. The homeland is not something that you represent from outside India, but there is a sort of nationalism that is associated with your food, what you choose to, choose to eat. And the next interesting turn comes in in 2014. I don't know whether you remember what happened that year, but it's historically significant as far as the geopolitical identity of India is concerned. And TIS, the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, uh, media center or media department, uh, comes out with this documentary called Cast on the Menu, which essentially looks at the ban of beef and non vegetarianism, etc. And uh, taking that forward, we have Deepa Tak and Tina Arana writing about casting food, interrogating popular media. And then, and then, uh, then uh, Feast and Fast, A History of Food in India. This is Colleen Taylor Sen. And the last and most interesting work is Turmeric Nation, A Passage Through India's Taste by Shailashri Shankar, who argues that, like you talk about spices, right? Indian spices. Who argues that turmeric is like the only spice that unifies the whole of India? or turmeric. So that's why it's called turmeric nation. So Dalit cuisine, which is considered as, see, why am I going back to Dalit cuisine? Because it's the engagement with their cuisine that opened up this uh, idea that we cannot homogenize Indian cuisine, all right? But one thing about Dalit cuisine is that it's very simple and turmeric becomes one of the most important ingredients for them, all right? Turmeric and chili and salt. And that is essentially the argument of Shailashri Shankar, so to speak. Now, these are all theoretical interventions, but I guess you got the idea that you cannot, in a way, use the Western lens to engage with food in India. But what is of interest further is the kind of text that's been written. So we have diasporic literature, 1995 to about 2007. Most of the food representations come through the diasporic literature, but Post-2007, there is this trend where there is a lot of experimentation with genres, for instance. I don't know whether you have come across Anita Nair's Alphabet Soup for Lovers. This is published in 2018, which is a very interesting narrative. It's, it's, it, it works largely like uh, pulp fiction. It's, it's about a, a, a love story. But it is each chapter is uh, given the name of a uh, food item. This is Tamil cuisine largely, but there is an interesting way in which the idea of dictionary itself is problematized. And when I was talking about dictionary, there is this food historian Katie Achaya, who has also published extensively 1994 and 1998, Indian Food, a historical companion, and a historical dictionary of Indian food. These are, his, these are also textbooks. Uh, and there is this experimentation with genres that happened in India. And there is this work called Yasmin Ali by Brown's The Settler's Cookbook, a memoir of love, migration, and food, which, is, which kind of asks you the question, is this a work of fiction? Is this a recipe book? Is it a memoir? It's, it's part of the Caribbean diaspora, but there is an interesting way in which the transition and transactions are also reflected in the textuality of the work. And uh, very quickly, uh, there are three anthologies which might, you, might be of help to those who are interested in taking this forward. The first one is uh, A Matter of Taste, the Penguin Book of Indian Writing in, on Food, published in 2004, edited by Nilanjana Ray. Then there is another anthology, the Oxford Anthology. This is The Table is Laid which is 2007, and the last one is The Writer's Feast, 
Food and the Cultures of Representation, published in 2011. So, if you have to track the direction of inquiry as far as food studies in India is concerned, it begins with diaspora from an outsider's perspective on to an homogenized idea of uh, Indian food. Then the geopolitics of India starts to take over where, you know, like Sir said, what you eat can also ironically kill you. That sort of, that's largely because of the geopolitical turn that happened uh, in India. And now we are engaging with something called the return of the indigene, largely trying to decolonize the realm of food studies itself. All right. So that's all, all of that is theory. Now I'm kind of inviting you to engage with how to do this. All right. And I'm going to show you a few uh, films. Most of you are familiar with Malayalam film industry, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those of you who are from outside Kerala, please bear with us. But I'll, I'll kind of translate it for you. So I am going to ask you to look at Idiyappam being represented in these narratives. All right. We are dealing with Idiyappam today. Uh, so I'm asking you to look at the visual possibilities, the textual possibilities, and the cultural possibilities. The visual, the textual, and the cultural. So we are looking at Idiyappam and its material history. And go back to the four aspects that I talked about. You know, on the personal level, the cultural level, the communal level, and what was the other one? But the four aspects. <coughs> The first film that I'm showing you is Kude, Anjali Menon's Kude. I, how many of you have seen the film? Most of you have. All right, so this uh, film is called Kude. Uh, which is about, about like, like we just we saw, just a, saw a, a brother and a sister, sister but, 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 but the sister is actually dead. dead. dead, 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 dead. Yeah? yeah. So, so only the brother, the brother can, can see her. See her. And, what and what is interesting is that she just stays inside that van. van. The, 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 the dog the and the brother are the only ones who can see her. So if you are looking at this, the early, the first bit of the conversation, she's talking about the experience of being dead. And she's saying that the popular conception regarding death is all wrong. We don't roam around in white saris. Uh, we are not invisible. And the most pertinent thing is that we are hungry. All right. And then she yearns for a lot of the delicacies that's part of a Kerala household. Puttan kadalakari and nool puttan. Nool puttan is idiyappam. All right. And the second scene is where idiyappam is served. And I don't know whether you guys have noticed, uh, they say that you can have it with tenga pala, which is coconut milk. But if you have kind of looked at the scene, you would have seen that there is a beetroot toran that is used, then there is a, a stew. That is when Jenny says that this is uh, my favorite stew, all right? Uh, so Nool Puttum stew, Nool Putta is another name for Idiyapam. So as a text, you are looking at this text, this film as a text. So when you are looking at a film as a text, there are many aspects that go into it. One of the most important things is the diegetic and the non-diegetic elements. You know, that is often used in the context of like film songs, for instance. An example for that would be the next film. How many of you have watched Jai 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 Hai? Does Idiapa figure there? Yeah. So in this film also Idiapa is being used, but with a s different purpose. So this film is about a newly married couple. You. So there are two songs. The so one song that depicts their wedding day also has reference to Idiapa and Kadalakari which is the favorite food item of the husband. 
and she is introduced to those food ways of his in that song uh, and this idiopam is very difficult to prepare so you saw that mother doing this that's how idiopam is made so it's not yes it's a delicacy but it's it's kind of very difficult to make and this film in a way plays with that wherein there is a way in which whatever she prefers that is she would like parotta and beef but that gets replaced with idiopam and uh, chili chicken and also when uh, in her home idiopam is hardly prepared so when he visits that place that uh, wife's home they kind of bring that paraphernalia from up from the attic and all of that so there are interesting depictions of idiopam within the narrative but what i want you guys to look into is the way in which the two films use idiopam for instance uh in the first film coup day it is used uh to defamiliarize us to the idea of the culinary fetishes of say a dead person all right in the afterlife do they eat and there is another film that deals with that called iblis i don't know whether you have watched the film uh and also there is an evocation of a space as in jenny can only access within the space of the temple all right and we see her eating only within that space she never comes out comes out of it uh and i don't know whether you have noticed the frames uh of that supper scene where there is there are you know camera uh being you know show uh, like camera in a way of uh focusing on the kind of accompaniments with idiopam all right so i would want you when you're looking at films as text i want you to kind of look at this idea of diegetic and non diegetic aspects of a film for instance it's often used in the context of the songs being used so or any narrator narration that the characters can hear would be a diegetic aspect and the non diegetic would be anything that the audience can hear all right in the case of jay 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 hey it's very evident because both the introduction to the fact that idiopam is a central plays a central role in that man's life is introduced to us through the song endan id edan id engot id like which essentially is talking about how uh, jaya is kind of going into an alien setup so to speak but if you contrast it with kude you will find that Jenny is trying to bond with her brother all right and that bonding happens over food whereas in the case of jay 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 hey it's not bonding that happens bonding is supposed to happen but it's not happening so these two films were taken as examples of a text where a shared meal has been depicted over a period of time one is used to break down barriers even death for that matter and it is used to connect and on the other hand food is used to ostracize stigmatize and lessen the other so in that in in the case of jay 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 hey food can be uh, you can say that it's used to weaponize to some extent now i'll show you another clip which is just to take forward the dynamics between uh, parotta and beef versus idiopam and chili chicken this is another movie 2017 gota which takes place in punjab yeah this is a film that was released in 2017 interestingly directed by the actor who was acting in jay 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 hey and here also there are some similarities so there is this uh, female a uh, character who is beating up boys and these two guys one of them is from kerala one of them is from tamil nadu they are studying at punjab some university in punjab and uh, then uh, like the fact that this this female is beating up guys is what the the, the tamilian is worried about you know so the the keralite is trying to explain that women have come far right so this adi or id is something that is common to both the films so if you're looking at jay 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 hey id means like 
in Malayalam it means to hit someone. So it's idiyappam because it's it, it refers to that yeah the, the kind of exertion that you bring to uh, yeah make, I'm just reading it that way. But if you're looking at jay 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 hey, the idiyappam kind of translate to idi in the end. And in the case of Goda, why I have taken that up is because we don't find the food in the frame. But there is, an ex there is a very descriptive or very sensually, uh, you know, s uh, very, what is it? The description is so uh, visceral that you kind of feel that the food is there in front of you because you find the friend of his drooling over it. But there is no beef or borota in front of them. But there is also a listing out of the food items from a Tamilian household and a Malayali household. So what we are looking at is otherness and belonging. So they are in Punjab, which is part of India. One is a Tamilian, one is a Kerala, and they're talking about what they would be having if they were back home. All right? And both of them are talking about what their mother would prepare, but different items. So this is something that, in a way, links to the idea of Charitravum Bhumi Shastra. That's a dialogue that is set by the character Das in the narrative. So Charitravum Bhumi Shastra, Marikon Dirikyan. Charitram is history, Bhumi Shastra is geography, geopolitics. So it's, it's shifting. And there is a beautiful way in which food gets inducted into the narrative. And come back to 2022, there is a, a Malayalam film that's kind of going backwards, so to speak. Yep. And what I'm asking you to do, apart from look at the diegetic and non-diegetic elements, so how do you understand diegetic elements? It's something that the characters understand. Non-diegetic would be something that the audience has privy to. So how does food function in these narratives? It is, is it actually present in the life of these characters or is it something that is present as an absent presence to the audience? So think about it that way. You know, the, the connotations of the visual, the textual and the cultural. Now, uh, I'll refer to two texts, all right? These are also about Idiyapur. The first one that I'm referring to is this cookbook which is Eating with History, Ancient Trade Influence Cuisines of Kerala by Tanya Abraham, which was published in 2020. All right, this is a peculiar cookbook which looks at the maritime relationships and looks at the impact of various phases of colonization on a particular space in Kochi called Fort Kochi. All right, and this idiom figures in that uh, cookbook, cookbook under the heading cookbook, common staples with rice and bread and the, the description is this some staples are universal and it is difficult to li limit them to specific communities influences may have come from various sources idiopum for example is also seen in Sri Lanka which has a strong Dutch influence and then if you go to the page where the recipe is given, it says idiyapam, string hoppers, Syrian Christian, the recipe is that of a Mary Matthew Madatinkanan. And idiyapam, and it's said before the recipe begins, idiyapam is eaten with curry or along with sweetened thick coconut milk. We did have the reference to that in the films, right? Not in the JJ Jehe, but the earlier one. So in JJ Jehe, chili chicken is had with idiopum. What is happening there? Now I'll refer to another interesting book which engages with food in the context of pandemic, which is uh, this is by uh, Anjana Menon, Onam in a Nighty, Stories from a Kerala Quarantine. Onam in a Nighty. Stories from a Kerala continent. The Onam in the 90s, of course, a reference to how we all celebrated Onam in the year 2020 when we were all quarantined. Right? So it's a series of uh, anecdotes that uh, talk about 2020 and what happened in Kerala. And there is this uh, chapter called It's Not Business as Usual. And the reference is to the Thrissur Round 
or the Bharat Hotel in Trishur Round, which is a pure vegetarian hotel. All right, and she, and this is how uh, Anjana Menon puts it: It doesn't have to be an enormous meal. Bharat is well known for its limited, limitless platefuls at a limited price. The eatery opens at 6 a.m., serving up piping hot breakfasts, steaming idiyappam, and the list goes on and on. But you can see how uh, a food item that's, that is supposedly either had with coconut milk or uh, meat dishes is now part of a vegetarian tradition, all right? But uh, this narrative also looks at the food culture of Trishur and also the larger uh, quarantine-based food cultural interventions in an interesting manner. So that's a sort of a semi-fictionalized narrative. The other was a cookbook, which had a particular focus, which is referring to the maritime relations. And now I'm coming to Katie Achaya's work, which is from a historian's perspective, all right? So this is uh, the illustrated foods of India, A to Z. So the first two editions, because of the popularity of KT Achaya's work, the Oxford came out with a special edition called the Illustrated Foods of India, A to Z. Again, a dictionary, which was published in 2009. And yes, it, had, it has few images of the food items mentioned there. And E.D. Appam is an entry there, and I'll just read out the entry first. Fine noodles of a mash of boiled rice. So the earlier it was called hoppers, right? Hoppers, now it is fine noodles. Fine noodles, this is 2009. Fine noodles of a mash of boiled rice uh, gets extruded in a press. Press is that... Uh, uh, Ves not vessel, but it's the paraphernalia used to make it, is a press through brass, uh, dice, <coughs> dust constitute idi uh, appam, which is mentioned in the Perumbanur, uh, which is a 15th century text, as a snack being sold by venters in the seashore. It does kind of connect to the maritime interventions, along with the appam, ade, and modagam. A common breakfast item, it was accompanied then as now with sweetened coconut milk. Syrians of Kerala and the Kodavas of Karnataka, where it is called nul putta, eat it with a meat stew or chicken curry. In Sri Lanka, it is termed string hoopers, the latter word being an anglicization of the term appam. So hoopers basically refers to the shape of the vessel in which it is made. So appam is made in a vessel like this. So if the if the food made if the food item has that shape, it is called hooper. So it refers to string hoopers refers to the uh, vessel in which it is steamed. So if you're looking at this historical intervention into idiopam, you get yes to some extent the raw materials, but the way in which idiopam is represented or presented in these various texts has a different function, all right? And uh, what is interesting about Achaya's entry is how it engages with the various interventions of colonization. And also, I'll draw your attention to the publisher's note, so to speak. So this is Oxford. The book looks at food from a wider perspective, like principles, the ingredients, the regional influences, therapeutic diet as prescribed in the Ayurvedic system of medicine, colonial eating habits, Indian diaspora food as reflecting the cultural and regional origins of the immigrants, and through it, all it does, uh, not to forget the religious influence, for example, how the complicated mass of rituals dictate Hindu domestic cooking practices and how sevya are an integral part of Eid celebration. So if you go to Acharya's work, it reminds you of uh, the process of Sanskritization about with Narayan sir was talking about in the morning because it's written with that explicit agenda. Combining startling insights into the complex world of food with poet practical consideration of the availability of food materials and climatic suitability, 
This interesting book situates Indian food in time and place, including information on a host of historical factors that influence the regional cuisines of India, particularly the migration of food plants from the New World to India, and the interesting transfer of words words across languages, for instance, from Tamil and Malayalam, often by way of Portuguese or Spanish into English. This latest addition to the Oxford India collection should appeal to all readers. So I would want you to kind of look at the publisher's note through a critical lens, wherein you also understand the shifting dynamics of what constitutes the geopolitical entity called India. All right. The earlier descriptions was perhaps uh, trying, not politicizing it in any sense, but this seems to be doing this. Now, I want you to focus on two aspects, availability of food materials and climatic suitability, and migration of food plants, which takes us to the first bit of the title, culinary terroir. So terroir is a term that is used largely within continental cuisine, and terroir is often used in the concept, context of French wines. So wine that is produced from certain parts of France would have a peculiar taste. And it is said that that taste uh, comes in because of the peculiarity of the soil from that region or the climatic conditions from that region. So terroir, in a way, means a sense of place. Right? And it refers to the climatic conditions and the ecosystem of that particular place. So there is a way in which uh, there is a connection to the ecosystem, not only in terms of material availability, but also in terms of how the taste is defined and redefined. Hence, I've used culinary terroir. But if you're looking at the migration of food plants here, that is referred to, and also the migration of words across languages, which takes us to the whole idea of metaphorics of it, right? And if you're looking at, say, meta I'll come to the metaphor part in a bit, but I will kind of draw your attention to the idea of terroir again. A plant thrives in a conducive ecosystem even when it, uh, it migrates to India, for instance. So we have a lot of uh, staples of our everyday life migrating from Latin America. But why is it thriving in India or in Kerala? Because we have similar climatic conditions, right? So that could be the reason why tapioca uh, strives, like, becomes a staple here. A plant thrives in a conducive ecosystem. The fact that tapioca and rice and banana are staples of Kerala diet is because the places from which it is migrated has a similar climatic condition that helps it to thrive here. Hence, there is a connection. All right? So that is the terroir that I'm invoking. And when you're talking about decolonizing Indian cuisine, it is also in a way connected to the terroir or the terrain, for instance, because Anything that is not natural cannot in a way sustain itself and cannot in a way give meaningful interactions because it doesn't in a way make sense for you to have idiopam with chili chicken because it's part of a larger, uh, you know, what was referred to as that intervention of a soft power, you know, the Chinese kind of coming into India. We have also the alternative cases of plantations like tea and rubber, which were not in a way grown in the colonial nations, but in the colonies. And similar is the case of stew coming into the Indian cuisine, or for that matter, baking. Yeast was not something that was intrinsic or, intrinsic or endemic to Kerala, for instance. And uh, we have Mamboli Bapu coming up with a concoction made from our own spices and fruit juices, which was used as a supplement for yeast, right, when he began to bake the first cake in India. So there is a way in which terrain and terroir are interestingly acting as, as uh, aspects through which we can decolonize the idea of a homogenized Indian cuisine. And now I come to the migration of words across languages part. And Mary Douglas, in her work, Thought Styles, Critical Essays in Good Taste, which was published in 1996, talks about this. So she is looking, that work is largely coming from a cultural studies perspective, to be more precise, an ethnographic perspective. And she says, 
All metaphorical identifications depend on making a match. The exercise is to identify sameness in both fields. And social and literary context justify your reading. So what she is talking about is that when an anthropologist goes to a foreign land and engages with the local testimonies, the anthropologist is not able to understand whether it's part of the normal or whether it's an anomaly because the anthropologist is not part of that culture, right? So a foreign metaphor has to have a local testimony is what Mary Douglas is saying. All right. Idiapa might not have its origins in Kerala to be precise, but its origins from Sri Lanka having a Dutch influence does have a, a sort of a signification or a match in Kerala. But how far does chili chicken replace coconut milk or stew is another question that I leave to you. Uh, yeah. So this is the end of the session in a way. All right. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, you can. Thank you, ma'am, for your enlightening words. Moving on to our interactive session, the participants can raise their queries. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, can you suggest a source text that would link health humanities and food studies, uh, specifically oncology? It's for a, a project. Speci specifically oncology. Oncology. Health humanities and food studies. There are graphic narratives about oncology. Yes, ma'am. Uh, like um, we were able to trace only narratives, but not a source text. I have not come across a text that has connected medical humanities with food studies in that sense, wherein it's all listed out that way. But I guess work is going on, but no theoretical interventions as such. Because it's, it's a nascent area, it's just being explored. So we are looking at eating disorders and things like that, but no theorization as yet. Ma'am, I have a question. Uh, you have told about uh, diegetic and non-diegetic. Diagetic which uh, characters can understand and non diagetic which is understood by audience. Ma'am, can you give an example of it to clarify? All right. Uh, see, it's a technical term that's used within film studies. It's often used to talk about songs, the use of songs in the narrative. Uh, you Do you watch Hindi films? Have you watched Dilwale Dulhaniya Le Jayenge? There is a song called Tujhe Dekha To Ye Jana Sanam. Yeah. Uh, so you know that the characters are in the field somewhere in Haryana, but the entire song is shot in, shot in across Europe. Yeah. So are the characters inside the song? They are in Haryana, they are not inside the song. So that is a non diegetic yeah, so I was asking you to metaphorically engage with how food is used within film narratives and also in text as well. Because there is a tendency to just dismiss the descriptions of a meal, for instance, in a literary text, thinking that it's part of the everyday. All right. And also films have a lot of dining scenes, but 
it's often kind of dismissed. So that was the point. I want you to kind of look at how food has more potential. In fact, ma'am, uh, looking that those things, uh, new dimension has opened. And okay. we were talking like we, we are definitely going to have idea from today. We are going okay. to try. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. You can try many other things. I just took it here for Okay. No, no, no. Like, like watching, watching it, it, the pain, the post, the hard work mother is doing to prepare it. We can understand, we can feel. Like it takes a lot of labor, but she's preparing it. It means, it means a lot. It shows yeah. that it means a lot. So that is the literary aspect which we are seeing. And uh, shifting over the favorites, that is also very symbolic about patriarchy, which we see through food. So okay. This is a different thing. Yeah. So, and you have elaborated it. So, you know, we were kind of waiting. Let us see how it is prepared and what taste it has. You have mentioned it several times and kind of given a literary touch to it. All right. So, it created an interest. So, let me also make a point. If I had used dosa as an example, it wouldn't have made such an impact yeah because yeah. it is we know about it but uh, the hard work is not too much into it how much it gets into this thing idea yeah, yeah. yeah. So, thank, thank you thank you, you so much and also there is another concept called tinai which is borrowed from the sangam literary tradition which talks about how literature from a particular region has <coughs> uses metaphor very specific to the ecosystem of that region. For instance, there are five tinais that was uh, highlighted, that is Kurini, Pale, Nule, uh, Marutan, and Naitan. Right? So during Sangam literature, poetry used to be written as in we could read a poem and identify where the poet was from based on the metaphors that they use. So that idea can also be used to, you know, come up, like to address questions of which food is Indian, for instance. So you can say that um, chili chicken to some extent is okay, but if you have to eat masala dosa ice cream, uh, panda maggi, you know, there is, there are, there are a lot of food fads and food trends. So many scholars ask me, how do you then, you know, identify what to focus on? The answer is very simple. If it's, say for instance, masala dosha is always had as a main uh, course. It's never a dessert. If you convert something that you have as main course into a dessert, it doesn't function well, right? And also there is, there are these ice creams of quote unquote Indian foods. For instance, there is Gajar ka halwa ice cream. That is to some extent okay because both of them are desserts. Right, so how do I decolonize the idea of Indian cuisine? The answer, the closest answer that I could find was going back to the logic of Tinai, which essentially says that you are in a way connected to whatever materials or resources that you are born into. All right. So if you can make any food items out of what can, of any materials locally available, that would make sense. Hello. I just wanted to ask you, uh, in Kerala, we talked about India, uh, how food is homogenized through text. Uh, in Kerala, are there any texts that we see where food, in Kerala also it is heterogeneous highly, but food uh, is, uh, discourses actually homogenized food. Uh, I actually uh, discovered some cookbooks, mm -hmm. contemporary cookbooks, where the titles go by the names of Kerala cuisine or essential Kerala cuisine, mm -hmm. but they deal with a lot of uh, different foods. And like, what is your opinion on cookbooks on, in Kerala? See, uh, cookbooks, dictionaries, anthologies, so I listed out three anthologies for you, right? All of them come with the politics, is what I believe. 
right? So I referred to a cookbook. Actually, I referred to two cookbooks. There was the settlers' cookbook, uh, which was alluded to. All right. Then I ref read out an entry from a, a cookbook that is talking about maritime interactions. So I think, to a great extent, you would have to, when you are reading a cookbook, you will have to be aware of the rationale or the politics behind the preparation of the cookbook. All right. Does that answer the question? Because you cannot kind of say that this is an authentic that. moment is lost from us so there is nothing authentic so to speak but there are mediations or positions as sir was talking about any other question i hope my session was helpful to you Thank you. Thank you.